Hi, welcome everybody. Um, we are pleased to present the Cambridge Writers Workshop benefit reading for the Institute of International Education. And I'm here with some amazing writers. Um, we wanted to support international students because they are going through a particularly hard time um, right now in the US. Um, many uh, institutions are having trouble with um, student visas, with the new policies. Um, and of course, the global pandemic is also very hard on international students. Um, so we are supporting the Institute of International Education. So please click on that donate link. It's in the event um, and it's also in the description here. And uh, we would really appreciate it if you could take a moment to make a donation there. Um, IIE's mission is to help people and organizations leverage the power of international education to thrive in today's interconnected world. They believe that when education transcends borders, it opens minds, enabling people to go beyond building connections to solve problems together. They say our vision is a peaceful, equitable world enriched by the international exchange of ideas and greater understanding between people and cultures. So we're pleased to support them. This has been a series that we started in May and we've supported some other causes including Black Lives Matter uh, by supporting Black Visions Collective last month and also COVID-19 by supporting the Boston Resiliency Fund in May. So um, without further ado, let's start our reading. Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first reader. Diana Norma Sokayoi is the Executive Artistic Director of the Cambridge Writers Workshop and co-founder of Chagall Performance Art Collaborative. Her books are Credo, an anthology of manifestos and source book for creative writing, Parallel Sparrows, and Roses in the Snow. Her poetry manuscript, Milk and Water, was a finalist for Hunger Mountain's 2020 May Day Mountain Chapbook Series. Her poetry is also shortlisted for the 2018 Bridport Prize and received honorable mention in the 87th Annual Writers Digest competition. Her work has been published in Mervox Quarterly, Vita, Quellville Magazine, the Boston Globe, Luna Luna Magazine, and has been anthologized in other countries, Contemporary Poets Rewiring History, Teachers as Writers, and an International German Anthology of Roma and Sinti Writers. Her poetry music collaborations have hit the Creative Commons Hot 100 list and have been featured on WFMU. In addition to all this, she is the curator for this this evening's event. So please put together a warm welcome for Diana. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to read with all the poets and writers here on the um, call and I can't wait to introduce them all to you. I'm just gonna read one piece and it's actually a piece of creative nonfiction called Walnuts. Walnuts, Dio. My grandmother, Mamushka, lives by the seasons. At the end of summer, she said over the phone that she would leave the river Kurdish by the end of the month, but that she would return in October in time for the harvest. She harvests walnuts, dio, the walnut tree, dio fa, that my grandfather, Papushka, planted, the source of the very dio that sits in my pantry. In my pantry, in my house by the sea. The deal that I grind and mix with sugar and put on my palachinta, thin Hungarian crepes. The deal that my spouse, Deneshke, puts on his salad and declares so flavorful. The deal that I always save a few of because I don't want to be out of them. Thus, a small portion goes stale in the bag and then just sits there. I don't throw them out until Mamushka brings a new batch the next year, many months after she has harvested the deal. 
after carrying them home on the train that snakes past the endless sunflower fields, after wrapping them in cloth and storing them in her pantry in the cozy cottage that Papushka built her by the river. Then, about a month and a half after Christmas, Mamushka takes the Dio out of her pantry. She puts them in resealable sandwich bags, rolling them up in her clothes that she puts in her suitcase that she brings across the ocean, brings to me. She gives the gifts of the Dio to me, and I put them in my pantry. I only eat some, never all. This is how our pantries, our altars, I don't have any ashes of Papushka, yet I have the seeds of the tree that he planted. I have memories of him stopping on our walks, picking up Dio and giving them to me, stooping down with a smile, opening his palm to reveal a single wondrous walnut. Cracking it open, I would half expect to find a baby fairy inside like those embroidered Hungarian baby doll ornaments crafted into a walnut cradle that would hang from the tree at Christmas. Mamushka and I repeat the ritual of this gifting each year. This is how we honor him. This is how he honors us. The Dio continues to nourish and ground Mamushka. The walnuts are always constant, always there to harvest. They always show up. They're always steady. She can depend on them. When Pabushka planted this walnut tree, he meant it to be rooted firmly, faithfully bearing fruit each fall. But did he foresee that she would continue the annual harvest in his absence for so long, for over 25 years after his passing? She keeps caring for this walnut tree and it cares for her. The walnuts are never abandoned on the ground she has a purpose for them. She carefully plans when she travels back from the country cottage each year, always after the walnut harvest. I keep receiving the deal. God, let me churn out even half the nourishment Mamushka churns out of the earth and gives to others. I will be grateful. Thank you. Okay. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next reader. Nandani Bhattacharya was born and raised in India and has called the US her second continent for the last 30 years. Wherever she has lived, she has generally turned to books for answers to life's big and small questions. Her short stories have been published in Meat for Tea, The Valley Review, Storyscape, Journal, Raising Mothers, the Bacon Review, the Bangalore Review, Oi Drum, and Ozone Park Journal. She has attended the Breadloaf Writers Conference and held residencies at the Vermont Studio Center, Vona, Craigerton Writers Residency. And she was first runner up for Los Angeles Review Flash Fiction Contest in 2017, 2018, a finalist for the Fourth River Folio Contest for Prose Prize 2018, Long listed for the Disquiet International Literary Prize 2019 and 2020, and a finalist for the Reynolds Prize International Women's Literary Re Award in 2019. Love's Garden is her first novel. She is currently working on a second novel about love, racism, xenophobia, and other mysteries, titled Homeland Blues. She lives outside Houston with her family and two marmalade cats. And I had the pleasure to meet Nandini on one of the Cambridge Writers Workshop retreats that she came on in Paris, where she partially workshopped uh, this book that she's coming out with. Please do check out her new book. It's her first and it's going to be wonderful. She's such a talented writer. And so Nandini, please tell people also where they can uh, pre-order your book or get it eventually. Sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I am so honored and uh, really excited right now. Here is my book. This is the advanced review copy, uh, but it is available to order online on Amazon and um, you know Barnes and Noble, all those things. Just Love's Garden, Nandini Bhattacharya. You should be able to find it. 
So uh, it's, a, it's a labor of love for me. And it's kind of in that way for me, uh, aptly named book, but it also has the title itself, Sappy As It Is, has actually something to do with the theme and the characters, which you will know if you take a look at it. But I just thought I would read one chapter, a part of a chapter, and I'm going to start now. Uh, like every year, the Mitters throw their annual ball. Lady Mitters parties and dinners are popular events. Everybody who's anybody comes to them and the guest list is highly select. Afterwards, people talk for weeks, of course, about the decor, the food, the drinks, the fashions, the debutantes, the music, the dancing, until the next year when they're ready to be dazzled all over again. The night of this party in 1942, Prem stands as customary at the foot of the great stairs in the hallway greeting guests. She appears queen of all she sees. People may be forgiven for thinking this. People can hardly be expected to know that a desire to vanish lurks in her heart every day, growing a little stronger each day. She has been standing and greeting the world for a long time. That's Lady Midder's job. As she smiles, she wonders, could there have been another life, another family, another man? Could she have been that man's wife? She dreams again of the village these days. She dreams of Jagat Pandey. She remembers how thin he was, how frayed his clothes were, how battered his shoes were, all those letters never given to her. He never got any replies. Where is he now? Dead? Since the night she found the letter, somehow she thinks he can't be dead. It's a fanciful idea, she knows. But this is her real life, her family, this house, her creation. She has made all this happen. Of course she is the queen of all she surveys. From mere money and most of it dirty, she knows this for a fact. She's brought style and beauty into this house. From chaos and suffering, she's created a family. Mortly maybe, but happier than the alternative. And now even Roderick is back. The guests look at her admiringly. She's dressed for adoration. Her still jet black hair is done in a grand mignon. Mignons are back in fashion these days. Diamonds glitter in it, catching the brilliance of the thousand piece bohemian chandelier. She's wearing a deep blue and silver brocade silk. Her sari covers a silver beaded satin blouson shirt waist that emphasizes that erect and still slender carriage. She's still a handsome woman. The letters are in the trunk. The trunk is now in her vast wardrobe. Nothing in it has been removed. She will never open it again. The vial of pellets is under her couch, still almost half full. There is no portrait of her mother in the house and she will never again touch the one in the trunk. Saroj Devi Aulak and Akshaya Aulak will never be parted again. But today Harish is already here and Roma and Sir Norin is around somewhere held together with tuxedo, bow tie, pasne, pipe and self-satisfaction. Roderick is coming. This is her life, not a bad life in the end. She has found love and loved in unlikely places. Oh, oh, again and again. Everyone is waiting tonight for Roderick, the uncrowned prince of fairy tales in wartime Calcutta. Since Lady Sinha's party, he's flown a record number of times more and chased the Japanese away from Calcutta many times. Prem smiles, momentarily imagining the things people will begin to say when he arrives. A ripple will pass through the room. The swashbuckling Roderick Hartfield himself, Sir Sergeant Hartfield, the legendary slayer of the Japanese bombers incongruously called Sally, Knight Bowfighter. Such grand names they've given him, each one more than well-deserved. Most everyone else of consequence has, or has been announced, greeted, and discreetly crossed off the guest list by the professional staff hired for the party. 
Prem decides to give herself a short reprieve in her private parlor. She's been trying to be very good of late, cutting the pellets into quarters or smaller pieces um, until Roderick arrives. Walking past Sir Norin where he stands with a group of his cronies, she hears the conversation and a few stray words. They slow down her steps. They don't think or feel like us. Why should the best of society be encumbered by the riffraff, the inferior types, and their endless bad tendencies? This is the Honorable Mr. Lister, one of the eminent medical men of Calcutta, who's just been recognized and distinguished by the crown. A little knot of pear-shaped grandees is standing around him, some with pipes in their mouths, listening and nodding. Then Sir Norin speaks, indeed, doubtless, Life's not worth living, I say. As a member of the Aryan race myself, I do completely see the worthiness of that approach to our many social problems. After all, the Jews have brought it on themselves, another grandee offers. Though she should sail on past, Prem can't move. Before her eyes once again is the thin body of Jagat Pandey in frayed clothes and battered shoes. Again, he's eating his lunch of dry rotis, pickle, and a bit of onion or hot chili under a solitary tree with the sun burning the surrounding grass ochre. She shouldn't say a word, but she can't hold it back. She walks up to the gentleman, seeing the lady of the house approach, they make vaguely appreciative sounds. Are you saying, Sir Norin, that those who come from different classes and fortunes should be eliminated? That the poor are unworthy of living? or the races are never to mingle? Are you of the party of our modern Satan, Hitler himself? She has spoken more ringingly than she'd realized. The sudden silence can be cut with a knife. Sir Norin partially unfreezes, frowns horribly and says in his best blah blah. I'm saying my lady that certain experiments and actions already in progress in Western civilization to properly classify and rein in the sort of people who reproduce endlessly and cannot feed the mouths they bring into this world do demonstrate the advantages of distinguishing peons from princes. In the deep silence, Prem and Sir Norin's eyes lock. It's a dare. He knows what she's thinking and she knows he knows it. Certain experiments? Everyone knows really who Roderick's father is. She has always protected both father and son. And so Hitler is doing the world a favor, Sir Norin? A gracious aristocratic hostess doesn't speak like this at a party. But Prem reads newspapers more than even her husband. Sometimes after reading a particular report of war losses or news from Germany, she takes a little black pellet to numb herself, but this evening she's absolutely starkly clear-headed. Uh, she hasn't taken one since Roderick's return because she's happy after a long time. On the other hand, Jagat comes in her dreams a lot more since Roderick returned. Dead or alive, he comes. Well, he'd said, forever. Prem finds herself trembling. Someone puts their arm around her. It's Harish. He speaks to her gently. Come mother, let me get you a glass of champagne. The bell of the ball shouldn't be standing with her hands empty, right everyone? Some cheer and the wall of silence crashes down. No sign of Roderick yet. It is eight o'clock in the evening and the last light is fading outside. The lamb and greenery wrapping Alipur like a soft cashmere shawl is darkening quickly into a stony jade. Christmas is only a few weeks away. All over central Calcutta, especially around the military airspaces, near Chorangi and Park Street, lights blaze or twinkle all night. White and black men play jazz into the dark eastern night. Sometimes a raucous strapping woman belts out songs about being blue and in love. Customers stagger in and out, GIs and British boys, sometimes arm in arm, sometimes ready to cut each other's throat. The immense Christmas tree at Whiteway and Laidlaws soothes many a young white boy, still wet behind the ears, who has left his heart behind in Texas, 
or Montana or Yorkshire. But what is that? Suddenly noise as though from another end of the city ripples past and around the house, people rush to the large windows to look up and see unmistakably that a silent flotilla of aircraft has darkened the sky. The band has stopped and they're shouting in the street. Japani, Japani, Japani coming. Harish huffs and puffs across the hallway to find the household gathered around the great dining table. Someone tuning in vain the radio. The Japanese, despite Chevalier Hartfield's valor and courage have unimaginably come back to bomb Calcutta weeks before Christmas. Can this really happen? Of course it can. That's why Roderick is not here. Thank you. Great job, Nandini. Thank you. And people are watching um, on Facebook Live too. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce our next uh, reader, Stephen Aubrey. He is a Brooklyn-based um, writer and theater maker. His fiction and essays have appeared in Craft Literary, Electric Literature, Publishing Genius, and the Brooklyn Review. As a co-founder and co-artistic director of the Assembly Theater, company. His plays have been produced at the New Ohio Theater, the Living Theater, the Ontological Hysteric Theater, the Flea Theater, the Collapsible Hole, and the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where his original play, We Can't Reach You, Hartford, was nominated for, prestigious, for the prestigious Fringe First Award. He is an instructor of English at Brooklyn College, and he has also been an instructor at Cambridge Writers Workshop, which is um, where many of our community members may know him from. And uh, we are really pleased to welcome him. Please welcome Stephen Aubrey. Thank you, Norma. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight supporting the Institute of International Education. Uh, as someone who teaches a lot of international students at Brooklyn College, uh, this is absolutely a cause that is very close to my heart and to the concerns of a lot of my students who I dearly love and hope the best for this coming fall. Uh, what I'm going to be reading tonight is a story I have written called Coyote the Younger. In all those moments after he'd lit the fuse, but before the rocket powered roller skates propelled him across the yellow desert at sublimely subsonic speeds. In all those moments, what came most vividly to Coyote the Younger were the memories of his father, Coyote the Elder. How his father had crept across an inky horizon quietly and carefully, instinctively how power and grace were inscribed upon his long muzzle, how he held the roadrunner's neck almost tenderly under his paw, how the roadrunner would stare back at him, its eyes filled with something almost like love. Coyote the Elder had been a hunter, the last and perhaps the greatest of a line that dwindled to an end in Coyote the Younger the son who had forsaken the ways of his fathers, surrendered instinct and the old ways and traded them in for the blueprints and patents of Acme Corporation. Secrets industrial, not ancestral. As roadsides blurred to meaninglessness, as the unfathomable velocity of his rocket skates peeled at his face, pulling lip from dulling tooth, Coyote the Younger would find himself finally able to think clearly, ensconced in the warm moment before disaster. He would consider the breadth of his betrayal of the ways of the coyote, the ways of the edious birdius. And for what? A small collection of explosives and improbably backfiring gadgets? but the skates were already strapped to his feet. There was nowhere to go but forward. 
no choice but to search for the speeding blur of indigo against an expansive canvas of azure. It's meeps thundering across the mesa, harbingers of the irresistible. As his willowy body propelled through the tight turns of asphalt, he would pass the boulder where Coyote the Elder died moments after catching his 42nd Roadrunner. Full of cataracts and shivering with tremor, he had stalked by scent alone. And there, below that butt was the den where Coyote the Younger had been brought when he was but a whelp. The only time he had met his grandfather, Coyote the Proud, the one said to have caught 67 Roadrunners. Though, Roadrunners were also said to have been far slower and more abundant in those days. Days which Coyote the Younger habitually visualized in black and white. Coyote the Younger saw himself in the den again, shivering in the pre-dawn wind of the desert as he stared at his grandfather's sinewy body. The, fragment the fragmentary feeling of a wet nose brushing against his passed through the veil. Growing behind Coyote the Younger was an unbroken path of antecedents. Generations who had relied on nothing except their forelegs, their hind legs, and whatever interjections could fit onto a single wooden sign. Simpler animals, creatures of tradition and ritual, not mail order merchandise. Those who haunted the dust beside the never-ending highway that Coyote the Younger flew relentlessly upon, leaving a spiraling trail of smoke in his wake. But then the crest of the Roadrunner would peak over the next knoll, and Coyote the Younger would slide his goggles down from his forehead. His vision would narrow, the periphery fade. Nothing except the distance now. And then there was that moment before he struck the side of the canyon. That moment when the ruffling tail feathers of the roadrunner would tickle his snout and the odor of his prey's damp sweat would mingle with his own. That moment when Coyote the Younger would close his eyes and reach forward to seize what was his, forgetting about the hairpin, hairpin turn ahead only opening his eyes quickly enough to see all his momentum about to come to that inevitable nothing. Had his father ever felt this way? In all those moments afterwards, his broken body several feet deep in a coyote shaped hole in the side of a canyon, knowing that he had failed in some essential way that he was the last of his kind, and there would be none after him. Coyote the Younger would listen as he drifted in and out of consciousness to the double meep of the Roadrunner. As he lies there, the sky stretched taut above him, a shade of his father returns to him. In pantomime, Coyote the Elder explains that the Roadrunner is no faster, smarter, or braver than the coyote. What the Roadrunner possesses, even the Acme Corporation and all its grandeur cannot provide. Faith in the magic of the fathers. Faith that the road will go on forever without end. Faith that one can pass through the landscapes painted upon the dusty wall of a canyon. A power greater than any giant rocket any oversized catapult, any bundle of TNT, any Burmese tiger trap. In every of Coyote the Younger's failures, there is the same singular lesson that he must learn to believe, always to have perfect faith. For it is only when he looks at his feet only when he looks for the firmness of the ground that he never need doubt. It is only then that the coyote will find nothing beneath him. Only then that he will fall to the earth. Coyote the Younger 
can only manage one phrase in response to his father, can hoist only a single placard out from the hole he has found himself in, the same block letters scrawled on both sides. I don't know how to believe. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was amazing. So beautiful. Um, it is my pleasure to announce the next reader, Elizabeth Devlin. Elizabeth Devlin is a visual artist, poet, singer, and multi-instrumentalist. She is the curator of numerous art, music, and literary events, including the series, The Highwaymen, NYC, Prose by Any Other, and Token Folk Acoustic. As the founding director of Bessie's, a private artist studio and salon, Devlin hosts art, community, literary, and acoustic music events in Brooklyn. Devlin has toured nationally and internationally for over a decade. An auto harpist and singer songwriter with avant-garde folk sensibilities, she defies traditional song structures, weaving small worlds where magic and fantasies collide. Devlin's third full-length al album, Orchid Mantis, released in 2017, received 4.5 out of five stars from Imposé Magazine and is the follow-up to the previously released albums For Whom the Angels Named in 2011, Ladybug EP in 2011, and All Our Relative in 2009. In 2020, Devlin will release her second EP, Conscientious Objector. Post-COVID, Devlin will continue to tour and will release her fourth full-length album, My Father's Country. Please welcome my dear friend, and brilliant poet and singer songwriter, Elizabeth Devlin. Thank you very much, Norma. Um, thank you to all the other readers this evening. It's a pleasure to be doing something uh, like this the second time in I think five months I've acted in any kind of presenter um, position. So it's good to see you all <laughs> and to be sharing these moments with you. Um, so, I was, uh, I was watching um, a video today. I was watching the video of uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, addressing uh, some situations she had had to deal with recently. And I was really inspired by uh, the way she spoke and it got me thinking about a lot of uh, women who are in my life that have inspired me um, in these last several years and in these last several months. And um, that I selected for tonight, that I will, I will mention um, my witch wives. And very frequently, this is referring to um, a group of women who I'm in uh, a writer's group with. We're going on five years. But the term witch wife is actually taken from a Edna St. Vincent Millay poem. So I'd actually like to start off my reading by sharing this poem. It's called Witch Wife by Edna St. Vincent Millay. She is neither pink nor pale, and she never will be all mine. She learned her hands in a fairy tale and her mouth on a valentine. She has more hair than she needs, and the sun tis a woe to me. And her voice is a string of colored beads or steps leading into the sea. She loves me all that she can, and her ways to my ways resign. But she was not made for any man, and she never will be all mine. So again, that's Edna St. Vincent Millay. And I feel like this is a poem that I would dedicate to any woman I've ever loved. <laughs> so I'm gonna dedicate this reading to that. Um, this first poem is called Let Down. So let down is a, a noun and it has uh, three meanings. One, let down is discouragement, disappointment. Two, let down is the descent of an aircraft or spacecraft to the point at which a landing approach is begun. 
three. Letdown is the physiological response of a lactating mammal to suckling and allied stimuli, whereby previously secreted milk from the acini is expelled into ducts and drawn through the nipple. So this is let down. One, you have claimed this body, I do not object. It was never mine to solely possess. We are covered in baby fat, fit together like two warm jello filled water balloons, ripe and tired, raw and blitzed, pink and content, let down. It is delicious being this squishy. I'm a passenger in this cloud of lusciousness and we feel so good. Divine cream puffs, tender of my loins. My nipples are raw, they whisper spells, mint chocolate chip sundaes, magical camaraderie, let down. You're so voracious, I cry a thick mix of milk and blood filling your vampiric stomach. You are a journal of my efforts, days dissipated, nurse drink, sleep, eat, repeat, nurse drink, nurse eat, nurse drink, let down. Two, the bruised rivers and tributaries once flowing violent through the atlas of my abdomen are now ghostly and translucent are now as the rain rivulets shaking upwards on one illuminated airplane window. Shimmering droplets trail, my gut wrenches approaching Charles de Gaulle airport and longing for your slate blue gaze. I can't escape memory's gravity, let down. Labia and chest muscles ache with the thought of you. I long for the carnage of our shared bliss See your animated face on a glowing screen. Hear your muffled gurgles, squeaks. The pressure wakes me at 3 a.m. I throw, scroll through frozen images of you. Let down. My wet dreams are of the milkmaid variety. A mother's work is never done, even when she is far, far, far away. The heaving and wheezing of my breast pump leaves me cold. Who said it would be easy? I love who I married, I love who I made, I love what I do. In a farmhouse outside Strasbourg, the email says, C has again begun to file for divorce. Says, our marriage is broken beyond repair and I want out. I hear someone else's baby crying in Basel. Let down. Three. Two weeks away, too long, and my heart, which sat heavy and exposed above my clavicle, drowning in a pool of bloody anguish, pulsating by my neck snape, now sinks back to its rightful place below our breastplate, let down. Tuck in here, sink between my shoulders as the morning doves do, my head to my breast, your mouth to my chest. Here in our nest, everything else is background noise. You stay for hours. We wake up for lost time. The mother returns to the den. Daughter is alive. Mother is living. This is evolution. This is survival of the feminist. Let down. The gentle weight of your little pink drops into my palm. Here is my love. My body is flooded. Slight sleepiness, mild euphoria a higher pain threshold, increased love, let down. So the next two poems I'm going to read are, I guess they could be considered pandemic poems. More just the things that I've encountered in the last several months. One of the things I keep hearing people say is, well, it's when it goes back to normal, when things get back to normal, it can't last much longer. It'll get normal again. And I keep thinking, like, I don't know if you can ever go back to the past new normal, so it's really not going to be normal at all. And I was thinking about um, precedent and how in a court of law, you make a lot of decisions based on past precedent. So 
thinking on these things. This poem is called Past, Precedent, Future. One, intelligence does not thrive in captivity, or does it? Men and birds in captivity report great advancements. An African gray parrot can identify objects, colors, shapes, and do math when taught to do so. Sean Robert Hopwood is a convicted felon, an appellate lawyer, professor of law at Georgetown University. After robbing the bank, he molted his past precedent while pondering sorry to say cease. By the time he exited prison, he had metamorphosed into a United States Supreme Court practitioner. A snowfall outside my window indicates a downfall. The fatal flaw of the sky is that it is always falling. The hamartia of the aforementioned parrot is it learns too much to live outside the cage. It knows too much of the laws governing men to live beyond them. Duralex said Lex, that's the harsh reality of being clever. Is ability encoded into DNA or is it a potential prison? It is said genetic markers indicate predispositions to obesity, cancer, addiction, liking chicken, anxiety. I have a very intelligent bitch. Never have I met a more anxious dog. I am a bird, a snowbird, according to my ex-husband, a clever girl, robber, and thief. He used to call me my love. Two, my witch wife invites me to choose from a box of crystals, talismans, and stones. I select the red cross of St. James. The lower limb is pointed as if to be driven into, crucified by my own misguided witchiness. I am a martyr, sporting a self-inflicted solo palm stigmata. I was recently offered cheap Christian health insurance, but declined. I don't often frequent church, nor do I attest to the acceptable specific statement of faith. I like my unwed mothers to be covered, no rape kit required. I like my birth control dispensed. An IUD looks like a bird taking flight, a taproot, a crucifix with no place upon which to rest the head of Jesus. Buried deep inside my womb by a practitioner at Planned Parenthood, it's magic hormone-free copper snakes coil like crucified arms over two protruding plastic wings. With this knowledge, I take flight. Murder millions with each petite mort I receive draped over a gray bed. In three days, I rise. And this is gonna be my last one. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you again to the um, Cambridge Writers Workshop. And um, I am happy to be supporting the Institute of International Education, being that I have had many friends who have come to the United States to learn, and I myself have gone to other countries to learn as well. So uh, cultural exchange and educational exchange is very important, and we need to keep that going for sure. The ship of Theseus still remains. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the ship of Theseus. The idea behind it is that if you have something and you're constantly replacing parts of it, is it still that thing that it claimed it was? Or does it become something else? You speak of the ship, whisper into my ear that for which I am longing, air, a breath of space and thoughts with which to fill my idle quarantine brain. Some may say I have ruined you, but others might say I have perfected you. There is a choir of ornaments in Barbara's yard, multitudes of heart-shaped bell flowers dangling pristine white clappers into a besmirched Brooklyn breeze. A plague on all our houses. Lord, bless us with a Passover this April. Keep us safe as we kneel behind our bleeding hearts. I make myself in the, in the flower's image, flushed, crushed, genuflected and crossed at your feet, smear of blood around my mouth, collapsed into the bleeding heart between my legs. My lips part singing my master's praises. Metaphysical realists consider the flowers, recognize they exist independently of one's thoughts, that they have their own nature, separate from how one may conceive of them. When it all becomes too much or too little to bear, I cling to the metaphysical states of my witch wives. 
invoke them in the morning when I wake, before my progeny on earth or the seraphim in heaven have risen to mischief. When the only sounds are a mated pair of morning doves gently cooing, a saying to hold time inside the tree outside my bedroom window as distant ambulances scream down Atlantic Avenue. Oh, great ship, you are then now always generations. Pentaconter, trireme, tessera conteris, Odysseus lashed to the mast, Sappho ferried to Lesbos, Jason peering into the horizon. New timber is because your weather beaten wood called out for it to be hewn. 30 salted oars stretch from your hull, a noble albatross you long for flight. We are all one, inexplicably linked in chaos, rebirth, metamorphosing to construct new halls, perpetually transmuted into a cyclic evolutionary conglomeration of parts. Yes, Whitman, we are large. We contain multitudes. And though we may appear as Frankenstein's monster, juddering, disheveled, transmogrified limbs, skin, so lightning will lay up, cauterize their separating traumatisms. Deconstruct, reconstruct. At the end of Manhattan Avenue, a wind-shredded, threadbare American flag petually flies at full mast. Birth a baby, then the afterbirth, a round loaf of organ possessing a sticky, sweet, metallic, deliciously, unbearably human odor. The tree of life, covered in death, still remains. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thanks. That was incredible. Oh, all of your pieces are just getting right to my core. And um, thank you again, everyone watching for supporting the Institute of International Education. I think I know from everyone on this call that we've all had meaningful experiences abroad. I've had those kind of conversations with some of you, actually most of you, um, and with some of you have traveled. Um, to various places and some abroad. So when we have cultural exchange, our lives are enriched. We can open our minds, um, gain new perspectives. So um, let's continue to support international students in this country. I mean, what? where would we be without international students? I think um, it's really audacious to think that we could even be half as wonderful of a country without our international exchanges. Um, so I am very pleased to introduce our last reader, um, Heather L Thomas Lepp. She is pursuing an MFA in creative writing. And I'll just pause to say tangentially, that's where we met. Um, we are both in uh, the MFA in writing program at Vermont College of fine arts and we're studying poetry. And so Heather is a new friend um, and a brilliant poet. So just really excited to have her here. Um, she likes to meddle with her favorites, poetry, hybrid, and the lyric essay. She has worked previous, previously as a journalist, writing profiles on local artists and events and the music scene writing songs long before poetry in bands since childhood. Her poetry explores Native American mixed blood identity, the camaraderie that can be found in poverty and intergenerational trauma with humor and tenderness. She is working on publishing her first book of poems entitled, If I Were an Unhooked Rabbit. Heather spends her free time cooking elaborate meals for no one in her tiny house in the woods where the fear of being mauled by a neighborhood cougar is a daily concern, please send help and dinner guests or dinner guests. <laughs> um, as you can see, she has quite a sense of humor. Please welcome Heather thomas Lepp. Hi, I'm sorry, that was way too hilarious. Hi, everybody. Thank you, can you hear me? Okay, um, thank you so much, Norma, and thanks for everyone. Um, your readings were so beautiful, really touching. Um, so I'm gonna start reading. Um, 
Um, Norma, you were just talking about um, cultural exchange and in, you know, this thing about international students and living around the world. Um, this first poem is about, about living in the Arctic Circle as I, I work there as a journalist. And so it's very, this is very close to my heart that this, the whole, the thing that we're, that we're, you know, we're doing this for international students and cultural exchange. So this is not about trauma. It's about mountains. The first open casket I ever laid eyes on was maybe a shoebox holding an Eskimo, mother in her 30s, my age, the time they dropped me out of the sky, a feather into this frosty blue aisle of moon-faced munchkins, a veritable Arctic Oz. The children waggled around, chubby stumps flying, ice skating on Nikes, sucking on a Coca-Cola like you or I take a smoke break, slurping their own salty heritage, whose tears were real smashed windows, but flowed too gently like wind from another country and another season, a mild Mediterranean. Their crying was cranked on and off like utilities since moms and aunties and cousins kept ending up in shoe boxes with their eyes glued shut, legs like a set of empty stockings curling in their own shrieking aversion to emptiness. But this is not about trauma. It's about mountains. And all the times, tuckered, I simply sat down in my overalls, felt like a baby left cradled by their majesty, and cried some kind of brand new freedom split from flagstone, the Yeti's windblown well wishes delivered at glacial pace, whistling through flat molars, jaws pulsing from pulverizing branch and bone. I was nothing better than a blip on a walkie-talkie. White goose feather eyelashes spanning to the very end of civil twilight for another red dot saying, we made it in Morse code. But this is not about trauma, it's about mountains. Rolling down Main Street, mammoth foothill like a loose barrel laughing my head off while children pilot their own bodies as bumper cars over ice, handmade parka as shield, their tender faces blushing in fur. That's, that's that one. This is called, um, this is brand new and it needs to be um, worked on for sure, but I'm just gonna do it. It's called, I hope it helps. My brother wants to lay claim to all real diseases and phobias. Since the chips are down, they should end up in his jacket pockets, jingling, I told you so, I told you. He says that everyone pretends to have arachnophobia just because, but I have to pack a bag and actually leave the house. Dude, bro, their bodies are made of mascara smeared tissue. They curl up like a dahlia drowned at the scape, yet the terror is a helicopter ax in both of our hearts. They're only scared little monsters, I say, when he starts in with the high blood pressure and the algae blooming thyroid heat wave that floods his face, I say, dude, it's probably nothing. But I sleep with a wet towel in place of a blanket. I suck on ice. I was never afraid or I was never stuck like this when I was still young, he said, preparing the miso soup at two in the morning. So proud he holds up bags of wakami, dashi, bonito. The dried sea grasses, they don't look like much, but in hot water, they breed themselves into iodine flowers. Black leaves reaching into constant shelves. They know how to stop a heart attack, he says. Don't worry. Don't worry, I swear to God, we will play music again. We'll see all of our old friends' faces in the crowd, even the dead ones. But I don't say it out loud. The steam fills our father's kitchen with the strangest smells from the furthest of countries, unlocking the unknown, unwillingly. Another door 
into another decade. Thank you. Um, so this is another one it's called Full Stop. They couldn't remember their past lives. Featureless recognition, hand scrabbles, hand for a doorknob in darkness. Along with these things, the memory of tennis shoes hanging from a telephone wire, a father's number disconnected, landline telephone, flotsam and ruddy flood, a dead reservation dog, shot flat by a BB gun. Poor clothes, poor food, Western family, everything. Nothing new, chicken nuggets floating in a chicken water stew. Field day had a field day on us. Never ever fever plucked a dodgeball in someone's face. Always our face was the face that was shown. A pair of twin moon pies, big eyes, dog days. Why don't you run, run, run? Run like Budweiser, the dog should have run. You gave me your haircut so we would look the same. That's that pawn shop pedigree and I shirtless, titless, billet in brocade. Some asshole dressed me up this way. Playing war with you was a paradise in box elder. Digging holes for you to fall and die in was simply a love letter from the future because you are the worst horse whisperer ever known. All by your britches, you tried to touch him, tied, filliping under the fence, zapped your skull on electric wire, and you grew up just like that. Now I am the one who is reaching in animal fog for a friend who does not want me. Sioux City, Iowa, full stop. Santee reservation, stop once, then play that shit again. I need to make out the words. Video games forgot the willow. Jurassic size bottle of Woodbridge Alzheimer'd our footsteps. Distance begot radio silence. I need to know, brother. Are you still breathing? Blow out the window so I can listen with a tin can. This is my last poem. Thank you so much for listening. This is about my Indian mom. It's called Magpies. Women are kind, dirt poor. Dancing dervish on chili dog night. We never had two dollars to unfold between us. Never two shovels to dig the same hole. But we kitchen gab about the current trends. We bluff and we bluff in bourgeois. Threat to get our hands on something that will smooth this horrific transformation into old age, like, I don't know, hair dye. Hair dye. Magpies, we collect, play, we collect paper clips, a divorce earring, an amethyst, a bonsai, which are said to sim symbolize beauty and restraint while imprisoned in a craftsman when the eviction notice gesticulates with warnings of winter. I'm too young to go gray, I said to my mom. She doesn't buy it. She said, oh, turn the light on. But can the light be Lark, Juno, Crema, Perpetua, and never Clarendon? Can my head always tilt in half shadow when a computer boy asks my name and my body be cropped off in bedroom nebula? Just let me be a huge face framed in flowers floating. I produce a glass vial of roller perfume that I found in her eyes, wheeling obsidian, pass over and smile. She usually wants anything and she'll even take your junk. She'll tie buckskin to an ear of it. Try it, I say, holding in the air like a joint. She snatches and rolls it delicately over her scars like little instances of white lightning. Smelling her brown bones, she begins to sob. It smells like my mom. She buckles over and hides her falsies under paper skin claws. It smells like her sheets, it really does. And she holds her hands up flat like she's smoothing the linen. I tell her to keep it. And I wonder what I am going to miss the most. Gravy and fried chicken. Doesn't really have the same romance of amber and sandalwood. Her elegant poverty, reservation, magpie magic. There's not something I could gather up in a drawer or hang from a chain. 
how this perennial refugee can turn an abandoned blanket into actual bird wings for fancy dancing, a plastic clip into an artifact from an archeological dig, a scrap of black lace into an Egyptian arm clip, a cerebus to protect the house into a guinea pig, an actual rose that fell from the neighbor's yard into a rose that never fell at all. A rose that has risen to marry a turkey feather. And a sorceress who joined them together. How clever she did with a safety pin. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That was amazing, Heather. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just honored to be here with all of you. And um, thank you for coming, those of you who are watching on Facebook Live. Um, we loved reading your comments. This will be up on our pages. So um, thank you so much. And everyone on the call, I'm going to stop the live stream. But if you want to stay on and say hi to everyone, we're going to hang out for a little longer. So bye, everyone. Thank you.